been a hot minute since I've done one of these director's commentaries. Um, so these two, I haven't, uh, I've been really busy and my life's been all over the place since these last two videos. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't remember like all the nitty gritty details as I'm going through these because it's just, it's been a hot minute, but we're gonna do it anyway. So the Lobster War, let's start with that one. So first things first, uh, Lobster War. So that was suggested by someone in the Discord actually uh, many a times, Kata in the Discord primarily. She had been like begging for this video for I, I swear like a year. Also uh, Duek, Jesus Christ himself, and uh, Elihu all suggested this video topic. So we'll go ahead and get into this. First off, props to Cass. She drew the beard and um, the subsequent hat on my bird for this video. She's always great. She's been doing all the art for like my little costumes in each of my videos lately. So make sure to thank her and check her out. I have her stuff linked down below. Okay, let's get started. It's a story of small disagreements festering beyond reason, a chronicle of quarrels lasting through all seasons, a fable of ideologic conflict growing tenser than treason, all of which culminated into what was called a war, despite no shots being fired. All right, so just real quick. First and foremost, I have this painting in the background that kind of is like showing the Blue Jay family with some notable members. It doesn't have everyone in it, but it features me with my nice chompers, a little Red Jay reference, Tim, who I used in my radio videos, the guy that I've been kidnapping and taking to my dungeon and all that. And then Timmy, who has been in like a lot of my videos since the DMZ video. The other like returning character that I've used probably more that I probably should have included is Alex, who is the guy that I use in my how to videos. I kidnap him and take him to like various scenarios and show him how things were done or how things were actually were in that like time period or specific event. So those are kind of like my recurring characters that I've been using. And then also this background in this picture was from my first wacky war tactics video. I re use that as like a little callback. And then I have my new granddaughter here, which is also a Jojo reference. If you can tell by the hair that it is Jolene Cujo's hair from the show Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. But she's also my granddaughter canonically. So that makes me canonically Jotaro's father. You're welcome. Oh yeah, I have a subreddit now, r slash bluej. I was able to snag it because the person who was a moderator for it that like took it because they're another creator named bluej but never did anything was inactive for two years. So I was just like, hey, can I have this to like the Reddit support team? And they were like, yeah, so that's a thing. You can go to r slash bluej on Reddit and post whatever you want. I don't really care. But luckily, a few of these fishermen heard some juicy gossip about this hot new spot just brimming with lobster on the other side of the Atlantic. And for the cherry on top, they were practically free for the taking, being surrounded by nothing but the open water, salty air, Brazil. I really like that sequence, just kind of like slowly introducing the various elements of the background. This is one of my, I think, best backgrounds that I've done. And I actually did a little bit of, I tried out some new stuff with my art style for it. So I have a very cartoony style. As you guys know, everything is kind of outlined in a strong black stroke. Even the backgrounds, I have black strokes in them. It's just kind of my style. And textures are very simplistic, sometimes have some like little detail like you can see on the fisherman's body here. And one thing I did differently is in the background, these mountains here, the black and gray portions where it shows kind of like the rock, rocky cliff face. That's the thing I haven't tried doing before. I basically did a blended shading where I did some vertical hatching with different shades of gray to kind of show which parts are being hit by the sun and which parts are being shaded. And then like by changing the color ever so slightly going down and to the left away from the light source, I added like a, a mountainous texture. And I really liked how it turned out. It took a lot of work to do all of that like individual line work and hatching, but I think it came out looking pretty good. <laughs> And you see, it was those clicks, thank you, John. It was those clicks that led us to lobster. Now for our next step. Okay, sorry. Uh, I think I know what this is. You boys are just here to conduct some routine research on lobster nurseries and just need one of those permits for a few boats, right? Uh, you know, that is exactly what we wanted to do. <laughs> Yeah, we got the research license. I had a lot of fun with that skit. I love just dumb humor. It's my favorite, but the French accents for this were kind of challenging. I tried to do more authentic French sounding accents. It obviously wasn't perfect, but uh, I did my best. And uh, let me see, uh, Lobzilla. I was trying to uncover that. That suit was a lot of fun to draw. It came out looking a lot better than I thought it would. Yeah, it's basically like a Godzilla joke. And I, I make them look a lot more malicious and backstabby than it probably 
probably was in reality, but that's kind of for humor purposes. Sure, this is all technically in violation of their license, but I've been driving with a suspended one for three years now and haven't had any problems. By the way, my li like, license is not suspended. I had some close friends even ask me, have you actually been driving without your license? And I'm like, no, what the fuck? I, I constantly lie in my videos. Not about the material, mind you, just about myself. <laughs> Refined analytical process to find out just how much they can bend the rules when it comes to a foreign country. So they ran the numbers on Brazil. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. We're good. Okay, so that, that joke, I really like that joke. Basically what that is, is me saying, because Western European nations do not view Brazil as a quote unquote white country, they don't treat them with the same respect for national sovereignty as you would for other countries that you would deem your equal in world status, kind of derived from bigotry. Keep in mind that definition of not white of Brazil is how a Western European nation specifically like France France would view a country like Brazil in the 1960s. So that should be pretty clear. I think for most people, that's pretty clear in the joke. However, I knew when I made this joke that I would probably get some critiquing comments or backlash from people saying, Brazil, not white. Have you seen the demographics? It's 90% white or something. Keep in mind, well, that wasn't as many comments as I thought it would be. Actually, there's, there's a whole different part of this video that got a lot more critiques than that, which surprised me, but I'll get to that when I get there. But keep in mind, white is different depending on where you are at different points in time people view different like nationalities of race as being a white race so like for a time italians were not considered white today in the united states you would consider an italian person a white person for the most part same thing with uh turkish people turkish people are considered white caucasian uh, by most classifications today but there are some countries that don't consider turkish people to be white and it's very similar in brazil the concept of white in brazil is very different there are people in brazil that an american today might not think of as white from an initial glance when they themselves would classify themselves as white. It's a complicated, touchy subject talking about race, who would have thunk? But basically, I did extensive research to make sure this joke was right because I was pretty sure that Western European nations like France did not hold a respect for Brazil in the 1960s that they would for something for some country like the UK or the United States derived from prejudice against the race of people that made up Brazil. And I did some extensive research on that and I kept a lot of evidence that I have screenshots of that I could provide in case people did not believe me. But luckily, I didn't have that much backlash for that joke. I think most people understood the joke and how it fit in, how it made sense. Yeah, basically, in the early 1900s, Brazil actually underwent a big effort to whiten their country. So like they did a lot of things like denying immigration from certain countries that didn't really fit the bill of what they were looking for. They implemented a lot of curriculum in the education system to teach more European history to help uh, whiteify. There's a different word I'm trying to think of. Basically to help just to reinforce that whiteness in Brazil so they could be more respected and taken seriously on the world stage. Why would they do that if they were already considered white? So that's kind of another big argument in favor of what I'm saying. But yeah, that's the joke there. France, France. Maybe we should check it out. That was all hand animated, by the way, frame by frame. I unrolled that uh, paper and spent time making all of those little individual frames showing the paper unrolling. I think it came out looking really well. It's always fun when I get a chance to do like the frame by frame animation, but you can actually like tell if you take the time to like rewind frame by frame. It's stuff like that that people don't really like take the time to think about that like progress of making these videos take a long time. Oh, welcome to the Red Lobster. We had an infest. A uh, table for two. Yes, I've got the perfect romantic spot for you two Romeos. What? No, we aren't. Doesn't matter. We're here representing the Brazilian Navy. I had so many people saying like, I need to know what happens with these two, these two Romeos. I need to know, do they end up together? I'll leave that up to interpretation. Pierre has been making some incredible progress. Oh yeah? What have you found out in your uh, research? They hurt. Oh, what? You get pinched, Lil? <laughs> No. You'll never amount to anything. <laughs> I was so nervous about what my neighbors thought when I was like screeching these lines like Pierre! Like screaming that. <laughs> I share a wall with someone and I'm sure they're very annoyed because oh man, these voice lines for these videos lately have been a lot more effort than I used to put into them. By the way, I don't know if everyone knows this, but I don't know if Red Lobster is a national thing, like international thing, but that is an established restaurant. I had a friend that didn't get the joke or just like assumed I made up a, res or a restaurant called Red Lobster. Red Lobster 
Spencer is a very famous seafood chain in the United States. And so, yeah, my joke is that they're opening up their own Red Lobster. Like, uh, we had the name first, actually, but they're trying to, like, capitalize on the clout. The fishermen returned in November to request another research license, but this time further out at sea on the continental shelf, outside of Brazil's territorial waters, which stretched 760,320 gumballs from the shore. Or for Simpletons, 12 miles. I always have to do a gumball reference of some sort. I'm trying to put one of those in each of my videos. Also, another thing that I have in each of my videos is a hidden blue jay penny, which I'm trying to remember where I put it in this video. I don't know if I've seen it yet, but basically what I do is I hide this little blue jay penny in my videos, and once I see it, I'll point it out. And the first person to comment in my Discord that they found the blue jay penny gets a special role, the penny hunter's role, for being the first person to find it. It's a little fun game that I like to play. Also, I don't know if you guys can tell but the structure of this video is and like the flow of it is very similar to my dumbest Russian voyage video. I mean, you can probably tell by the similarities in the title for one, but I'm trying to, you know, kind of go with that timeline flow and kind of gross simplification of various events and steps I and mean, the language I use is more simplified as I move on to like the next incident, the next time, the next time. And I also show the whole journey with a map like I'm doing now. I think that is really useful for these videos that are consisting of a single story that I try to weave together a bigger narrative with as opposed to my other videos which have you know like mini stories linked together by being of a similar topic and yeah I thought it came out really well I actually think I think this video is better than my dumbest Russian voyage video I know that's like everyone's favorite video of mine it's not my favorite video that I've done I think my best video to date is maybe my wild west one personally but anyway a Brazilian Corvette sees the French vessel for catching lobster without authorization, probably hitting a sick drift as it pulled up, but then again, everything I know about Brazil comes from Fast Five. This is kind of a dumb joke, but every time I think of Brazil, I think of Fast Five because of that one scene where it's like Dominic Toretto against The Rock's character, whose name I'm forgetting right now, Hodge, right? Yeah, I think Hodge. Like, in Fast Five is when he's introduced, right? And so Dominic Toretto is, so if you don't know Fast Five, it started out as these, like, fast car series where it's like these street racers who also, like, rob and stuff. And I think of that every time, and I realize I probably could have just pulled up a clip since I'm streaming, but I like performing it anyway. France made the claim that a lobster was in fact a fish, so therefore, they had the right to catch them according to the basis for fishing on the high sea set by the Geneva Convention of 1958. Brazil, for their part, pushed the thesis that lobsters were not a fish, but in fact, an economic resource, a part of their continental shelf that they had the sovereign right to exploit according to a different provision of the same Geneva Convention. They said, citing a treaty they didn't sign. So researching for this video was extremely difficult. It is a little talked about event, and most of the more detailed sources for this incident are in Portuguese or French, and there's not a lot of it. For example, one of the most detailed reports that I could find was the uh, Brazilian journalist talking about it, and it's hard because you have to like corroborate a lot of what they say. So for example, during this part talking about like their arguments about why a lobster is or is not a fish and therefore France can or cannot fish them. They mentioned like how their arguments stemmed from the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea at the time, which there's been multiple of them, but this is specifically talking about the 1958 one. They had said in that article that neither of these countries had actually signed this convention, but I like to do my research. So I looked at like the UN's actual website and their documents recording the various signatories and like having like the actual scanned documents of the these conventions and these treaties and I saw that they were mistaken this journalist he was looking at a specific portion of this treaty so for example the convention on the continental shelf so there's like four or five different treaties in this law of the sea convention right Brazil had not signed I can't remember if it's any of them or only like one of them France had signed some of them but not all of them and the argument that France used was from like international fishing treaty they did sign that one so they were wrong on that basically what I'm saying let me just back up. There's a lot of nitty gritty details that come down that like are really at the heart of this conflict, right? Because essentially it's a very big political war because there's not actually any shots fired in, in this war. I mean, there's like some warning shots, right? But there's no action. This war is very much a political war. And so that means there is a lot of nitty gritty details and legal details and like digging through treaties and various like international
international law conventions, and it's just a mess. So verifying all the reports on this topic is very hard. It's um, also a very niche topic, so there's not a lot of existing sources talking about it in detail. And some of the ones that do exist are a little biased, but I did my best to research. This is probably like my most, my second most intensely researched video with how like deep down rabbit holes I had to go. My first being my wacky duels video, which was a lot of fun to research. But this one I had to like, for example, I had to buy a book called The Foreign Par Policy of Charles de Gaulle by one of his cabinet. It's like a memoir by one of his cabinet men talking about Charles de Gaulle's history as president of France. That book did not exist online anywhere. I looked for it. I downloaded PDFs. I even paid companies to give me a PDF and they didn't. And I had to like fight for a refund for multiple months. I had to buy a rare book from the 60s that like I was scared to open with how old the pages were. But I did my best to fucking research this shit. And so I have, I think, more information in this video than you can find in most primary English source videos on this topic. And uh, for like the Brazilian side, the articles I had to directly translate to English. So there are some like things lost in translation, I think, and some interesting, yeah, just like some weird word substitutions. But basically what I'm saying is I've made mistakes in this video. I originally had where I say like Brazil, like uh, they said, citing a treaty they didn't sign. Like that line, I had that for France as well until I did deeper research before while I was animating the video and I had to like change the script a little bit. I made a tweet about it at the time. But anyway, it's a complex topic, not a lot of information about, which is kind of like the hard part about the type of content I do, which is obscure history. So I did a lot of work researching this and this is the result. I hope you like it. 400 Green Berets were a start, but they aren't going to be enough. Agreed. We must be careful, though. We don't want to replace the French as a colonial force in the area and bleed as the French did. That's a good point. Got any advice, France? So now with the pangolin being a geode, yes, according to our established law of modus operandi derived from the Fly Eater Sarlacc Pit model, yes, yes, then when taking the Laplace transform of this in a matrix with the crustacean equation, we find that lobster are in fact fish. No, no, no! This completely violates the Capricorn theorem! <sighs> Let's back this up. That whiteboard was a lot of fun to make. I almost went overboard with it and just kind of like kept drawing a bunch of random shit for it. But uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. But first and foremost, the beginning of this where I'm talking about like Kennedy increase of true presence in Vietnam. 400 green berets were a start. Uh, that's actually a reference to a real development in the Vietnam War in the early stages where one of the first things the US did was send 400 green berets into Vietnam. So just basically know that when I do skits, I actually try to keep some historical accuracy to them a little bit. But anyway, to the whiteboard, I, I just always thought it would be so funny to like imagining like everything else happening in the world in the 1960s right we're talking like pretty much during if not like right after the peak intention of the cold war things are crazy on the world stage you know we've approached almost nuclear armageddon for the first time in like recorded history it was the closest the the world has ever been to like self-annihilation you have all this crazy shit going on you have like the cuban missile crisis which was around this time as well you have all these you know like escalating built up, you know, like nuclear arsenals. You have hydrogen bombs being tested. You have proxy wars in full swing. You know, we're coming down from the Korean War. We're starting up the Vietnam War. Shit's crazy. And this is what France is concerned with right now is, yeah, with the lobster. I like the lobster in your butt. I want to take it from Brazil. Just like the, the parallel is so funny. Just like comparing and contrasting these. But anyway, the whiteboard was also a lot of fun. And I kind of like put some thought into some of these. So like I have like honey badger equals like fighter jet. I can't remember the specific plane model that this is, but basically, you know, like they're the fucking tanks of nature. They come through and fuck shit up. If you remember that like classic YouTube video about the honey badger, that's great. Recommend looking that up. I have the crustacean equation here. And for my nerds in the audience, you notice this is the continuity equation. So it's a real equation. I have like sarlacc pit as being equivalent to the, you know, the Venus flytrap plant. I have like a koala bear being related to a red panda, a cryptid, and maybe the stick bug. And uh, basically having, they're all like on sticks, essentially the koala bear, the red panda is on a stick and this is a stick bug. So like there's like some vague connections between these things. You know, you have like a pangolin being a geode because they have like a hard outer shell, but like on the inside, they're like kind of cool. And then you have, you know, Vaporeon is equivalent to something that I can't show on YouTube. <laughs> and, and did you know that in terms of human Pokemon compatibility, anyway, <laughs> yeah, I just, it was fun. It, you could pause and like look at this whiteboard and have a lot of fun just kind of like figuring out what things are. If a lobster is a fish because it moves by jumping, then a kangaroo is a bird. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's actually a pretty solid point. Yeah, and if a kangaroo is a bird, then, then a flying fish is a spaceship because it jumps through the air. Uh, a little weaker, but okay. And, and if a flying fish is a spaceship, then a seagull is an oil rig because it dives underwater. Uh, okay, let, let's settle down. No, if a seagull is an oil rig, then my wife is a fucking whore because she jumps from man to man. That was also <laughs> fun to record. I had my voice crack so many times when doing that line. I had to redo it so many times. So that is another one where I, I'm thinking like, damn, I need to like fucking wrap this up because they keep on hearing me just scream. My wife is a fucking whore. And I'm just wondering if I'm going to get like the cops called on me for domestic abuse <laughs> from my neighbors. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, that's a real quote by Admiral Paulo Biography. Him. Paulo de Silva is like the his actual name. This is like his middle names, but or something like that. I'm not really sure. I, I didn't I said him because I didn't want to like mispronounce it because every time I mispronounce a name, people just flame me in the comments and yada yada, whatever. But I, yeah, like basically. So the first part's a real quote. Like if a lobster is a fish because it moves by jumping, then a kangaroo is a bird. Be basically being like, oh, if you're jumping through the air, then you're flying through the air. Like if you say you're jumping through the water, then that means you're swimming through the water. And so like I make like, oh, what if you just kind of like kept going with that? Like a flying fish is a animal from the water that then flies through the air. So you're like skipping a whole domain there. Like he didn't go from water to ground and then air. He went from water to air. So that's basically the same thing as like an astronaut, right? Like you're normally on the ground, but you skip the air step and you go to the space, like the domain above it. So like that's the equivalency there. And then like a seagull, it dives under the water, kind of like an oil rig. It dives under the water. And then like, you know, my wife's fucking whore. Because <laughs> you get it. You get it. So the Brazilian Navy just continued seizing their ships going... Stop it. Well, making them sign a paper swearing they wouldn't return. But the French were like, ha, I can't read this. Okay, so you know how I said earlier that there was a part in this video that I got flamed a lot more for than, than my other thing that I thought I would get in trouble with? It's this. So, like, this is, I, I just typed some stuff into Google Translate because I don't speak Portuguese, sorry. I, I typed it in on the spot. It was like, uh, like, surrender, you guys are, you're a stupid idiot or whatever, and ugly and stupid. But the problem is I put ha ha with, like, a J, and that's something that a lot of Spanish-speaking countries do, like Mexicans, they will do a J because that's how you would pronounce it in Spanish. They do not do that in Brazil or in Portuguese in general. I was a stupid American and made that assumption that, oh, it's like the same as Spanish, whatever, ja, ja. No, they don't do that. They just use ha ha with an H or they use a K, like k -k 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 -k, like a bunch of Ks. That's how they would write the ha ha. So I got a lot of comments pointing out how I was wrong there because apparently every Brazilian that watched my video paused at this to read what it said. The French sailed over with a lot more confidence this time. I mean, they've got defenses now. What is that ever failed France. <laughs> Maginot Line reference. I'm pretty sure most of you do know, but for those who don't know, the Maginot Line was a strong defensive line that France had built in case Germany ever wanted to go to war again like they did in World War One. They were very afraid of that. They wanted to have protections in place. So it was a defensive line that was fit with bunkers and gun nests and just like all the bells and whistles, right? And their France-German border. And then like that was really strong on the border. And then after that, it was kind of weak because you have the Ardennes forest. So basically in World War II, when Germany invaded France, they went through the Ardennes, which was a very dense forest region in Belgium for the most part that they didn't really think a strong offensive could come through because it'd be hard to maneuver a lot of tanks through there, be hard to coordinate, you know, big supply chain routes through the Ardennes. So like it wasn't really expected, right? And that's exactly what the Nazis did. They blitzkrieged right through the Ardennes. They took over France. They skipped the Maginot Line. So basically, yeah, that's a joke. The, Ar the Maginot no line, a very strong defensive structure that was put in place, a strong defensive plan and strategy, but it was just kind of bypassed and didn't really help out the French at all during World War II. Brazil was about as likely to let them swipe their salty sea spiders as Hollywood is to pay their writers. There it was. So I talked about hiding a penny in the videos. You can see right by right here, there's a little penny. That penny is what I hide in my videos. It's a little blue jay penny. So every single video, I will hide one of those. If you're the first one to find it, make sure to ping me on Discord and just say, Yo, fucker, I found that shit. Give me the roll, and I will. But the same couldn't be said on the diplomatic front, as it was then that the French ambassador to Brazil visited President Joao Goulart about the issue. Oh my god, I did butcher that pronunciation too. And I still don't really know how to say it right. Joao Goulart. I don't know. I had a, a Brazilian 
guy in my server actually like record a voice line and send it to me to explain how I pronounced it wrong. I feel like I was kind of, I mean, I was close. I want to say I'm close. People can be very nitpicky on pronunciation. Fuck those people. I don't care. It just helps me with the, the comments, you know, when you correct me. So just keep on, keep on commenting where I'm wrong. I may or may not have written that line while intoxicated, but I wouldn't dare delete a line full of such eccentric flavor. I, I wasn't intoxicated when I wrote that too. I just wanted an excuse. I did say may or may not have written it while intoxicated. The answer was may not have been. Ugh, first they can't fish, then they can. Just kidding, they can't. Oops, now they've got two days to leave town. God, I don't understand this emotion I'm feeling. What you're experiencing is known as mixed signals, sir. No, I'm sure I tuned this radio to AM. No, I mean like, you know when a girl is kind of hinting she likes you, but you can't quite tell if she's into you because her actions give conflicting signs? Those are mixed signals. Paul, I'm rich in the president of France. I don't get mixed signals. I get bitches. So don't speak to me about your poor people problems. That's probably the most liked skit in the video. <laughs> I got a lot of comments talking about how much they liked that one. That was a very last minute addition. I almost didn't have this skit, but I thought about it like as I was recording the video and added it in. I'm very glad I did. Also, one thing I forgot to point out, but I had talked about it, I think previously, but for every video that I do where I show French people, I think I've missed it a few times times. But what I try to do is I always have these mustaches on every single French person. And you also saw that earlier when I was showing the countries and I had like a little mustache on France itself. It's just something I like to do. French people are great. I, <laughs> they're just fun. And they rely on the iron smelting textiles and chemical products of Brazil. Psst, psst, psst. Also, Brazil is capitalist and can help fight nearby growth of communism. Yes, yeah, so America wasn't very directly involved in this whole like fiasco, but they did kind of want things to settle down. They wanted to keep relations good because their primary, you know, thinking on the world stage right now is Cold War. Like I mentioned earlier, we are at the height of the Cold War. One thing that America liked to do in the Cold War was meddle with what's going on in South America. They want to make sure they they kind of like, you know, they want to promote democracy and freedom so long as that democracy and freedom didn't end up with socialism. And when it did, they stomped it out to show them what true democracy was. Democracy is when you choose the right choice, essentially. There's one right choice with democracy. That's America's view. So they wanted to keep Brazil on good terms with the West as a whole and kind of like settle down with France because they wanted to use Brazil as kind of like a beacon of influence in South America because they were a capitalist country. They wanted to help promote that capitalist image to the neighboring countries and help stop the growth of communism in the region. So that's kind of like where their foot in the race was, but they didn't really directly involve themselves a lot in this conflict. They kind of just were like, hey, you guys want to look chill down a little bit over there? Thank you. And this stubborn man considered Brazil's actions to be a slight on the majesty of France, so he did not back down, but instead dispatched the French destroyer Tartu to the Brazilian coast. When I say this was de Gaulle's France, that was more than just like he was the leader at the time. De Gaulle's reign as president of France could be argued to be somewhat akin to a dictator, kind of totalitarian. I mean, not quite. He wasn't, you know, he obviously wasn't like Hitler or Stalin or anything like that, right? When we say dictator, it sounds extremely bad. Basically, his grip on the policy and legislation and just entire ruling of France was very much so, um, the power of that was settled within the palm of de Gaulle's hand. They did have a parliament, but in that same book that I mentioned earlier that I had to buy that was written by a cabinet man talking about the foreign policy of Charles de Gaulle during when he was president did talk about how parliament didn't really exist when de Gaulle was president. Like it was there, but the authority that the ca the parliament had didn't really match that of de Gaulle. If de Gaulle wanted something to happen, it would happen. That was kind of what France was like during his time. However, he was for the most part, I believe still a very beloved president of France. He luckily didn't do a lot of very messed up stuff with his powers. We've seen with other dictators, right? But it also isn't really good practice when all of that power can rest in the palm of one guy's hand. And some arguments that this guy made, uh, Paul Renard, I believe is the author's name of this book, talked about how things could have gone better, including this uh, lobster war incident. When he talked about the lobster war in that book, he was using it as an example of how having all this power nestled in de Gaulle's hand could cause things to go out of hand, especially when you combine that with his larger ego and kind of like desire to have France's image as this mighty independent nation who can't be disrespected can kind of go astray and cause problems. And we saw that too, like with de Gaulle wanted to expel 
expel all NATO troops from France at one time and was opposed of joining NATO. He wanted to kind of keep the independence and strength of France and kind of like reignite that image that they had before the world wars where they kind of like, you know, became somewhat of a memed upon country as like one that surrenders a lot, even though that's not really true. I think like you can look at all of countries in the history of the world and their like total number of battles won. I think France is number one. I could be wrong there, but I remember seeing that graphic one time as like France is actually a very accomplished country when it comes to warfare throughout the entirety of their history, which isn't like a fair comparison, right? Because some countries are allowed around longer than others. And yeah, it's not exactly a fair comparison, but you know, it's still interesting to see that they are a very successful military throughout history, but they had some troubles recently with the world wars. And because of that, it tarnished their reputation and image that de Gaulle really wanted to strengthen. Along with these ships, Brazil continued to mobilize to meet the French at sea. Because sure, their arsenal was full of vintage World War II vessels, and sure, they only had enough ammunition for 30 minutes of combat, and sure, they lacked adequate fuel supplies, and sure, some ships were decommissioned with mechanical problems, and sure, the French had a state-of-the-art navy and air force to counter them, but at least they had their spirit and family. This portion of the video, I think rubbed some like wrong elbows with a few people. Not a lot. I want to say like maybe like two or three Brazilian commenters I had were kind of offended at how I talked about their Navy and we're talking about like, oh my God, their Navy is so great. What are you talking about? They weren't shit. This is just not true. During this time, Brazil's Navy capabilities were very weak. And I feel like some people just take like, they get the wrong take from, from like some of these like things that I talk about, right? So like, there's two ways you could look at this. You could look at me talking about Brazil's current Navy status as having a bunch of really old old vessels that were secondhand from the United States from World War II. You have, you know, like hardly enough ammunition, your fuel supply, like infrastructure and ships are just like in disarray. A lot of your best ships are currently decommissioned or in need of repairs. And you can look at that and think, God damn, Blue Jay's talking a lot of shit about Brazil. Fuck this guy. Or you could look at that and think, holy shit, Brazil's Navy was in such a poor state during this time and was not at all ready to be mobilized. And they were up against hardships, like trying to pull personnel in from holiday to meet the French at sea and they fucking succeeded. That, if anything, I think is more impressive. It shows how, yeah, Brazil was not in the best place during this time, militaristic wise, but they were able to fucking push back France and scare them off. That should be a lot more impressive. That should be your takeaway here, not the fact that they weren't good at the time. Oh, wow, that's cute. Neat little guns you got there. Uh oh, what's this? These looks like rockets. Wow, these sure are big, huh? God, I was so close to cutting that out of the video. This video originally was supposed to be like eight minutes long, by the way. I wanted to make this one really quick because I had a sponsor for my Egyptian video that was supposed to come after this and was a little late, but uh, it ended up getting really long, as you can see, 17 minutes. And that skit I almost cut out, but apparently a lot of people really liked that skit. So it just goes to show that sometimes I just gotta like, you know, maybe this is something I've just heard enough times where I don't find it funny anymore. Maybe other people will like it. So I kept it in. The French ships decided to head back across the Atlantic. After this, an agreement was signed where Brazil would allow limited French ships to fish for five years while sharing profits with Brazil. Which is kind of true, like this like little image is an accurate way to summarize what happened. You know, Brazil is, you know, really just taking all the earnings from his whore France on this over this whole situation. Every every outcome of this was extremely favorable towards Brazil. Like I kind of mentioned earlier, France is seen as a more respectable and first world country at the time than Brazil was. Yet in this battle of diplomacy, the one battle that pretty much almost always exclusively favors the first world countries ended up turning out in all areas in favor of Brazil. Yeah, sure. France got 26 ships to fish for five years off the coast of Brazil, but that's not much. If you think about it, that's hardly any. And all of those profits had to be shared with Brazil. They didn't get to just fish for themselves and take all the benefit from it. It was only a five year period too, which in terms of like agreements for uh, resource trading and all that is very short. So in all aspects, a very favorable outcome for Brazil. And you'll hear more of it here in a second. Who would also get to expand the nautical miles of its territory. You know, just a few. 100, 200 nautical miles. So that is, that's the establishment for that precedent that we would later see in that United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, where you get an exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles from your coastline. Basically, any resource found in that 200 nautical mile zone is exclusively yours for the taking and harvesting and exploiting. Other countries can't come in and drill for oil within that 200 nautical mile range. While it isn't a territorial range, I think at this time it was agreed to be a territorial range 
change. I don't know if that was later rescinded for the economic zone, but the agreed upon international law for territorial waters is 12, I believe, 10 or 12 nautical miles off of your coastline. 200 nautical miles is for economic resource harvesting. But yeah, this is the precedent for that, which is just kind of really cool that it came out of this situation. The Lobster War, eight out of 10 stars. Thank you to these lovely Patreon supporters. Thank you to these Patreon supporters. They help make these videos possible and they help me do a lot of these uh, new things coming up that you guys will see in future content iterations. But anyway, that was the Lobster War. Does anyone have any questions? Do I have any reasoning behind my ratings or are they random? There is reasoning behind them. I do think about what I give the ratings and it's a combination of how stupid and detrimental to the world and people was that event and also how goofy was it? How funny was it? And how much did I enjoy learning about it? So like for the lobster war, I gave it what, like nine out of 10 stars, right? Eight out of 10 stars. So it was very goofy. It was very funny. It was very silly. It was very dumb. It wasn't the most funny thing that I had read about. I think the highlight of this whole video was the fact that they argued over whether or not a lobster was a fish. There wasn't a whole lot outside of that that was like very, very goofy. I think I made this topic a lot more interesting than it was. Normally this is like, event, the interest stops and ends at the debate over whether or not a lobster is a fish. Other than that, it's just kind of like a, you know, it's a political battle that is just kind of like interesting to read about, but not super duper exciting and funny from start to finish, like the Russian voyage video. So I had to add a lot of humor and make it more entertaining. But I personally found it extremely goofy, extremely funny. Not a lot of people were negatively impacted by it. It wasn't like overall super detrimental to the world or anything. So that's why it has like a pretty high rating. There are other videos that have low ratings because they're just like absurdly stupid. They didn't have much of a point or an impact, but they're just kind of goofy. Or uh, my first fashion video, I started off with a low rating and then like, like a horse put a shotgun to my head and I changed the rating higher. So like six out of 10. This was also a very goofy video. The topic was very goofy and silly. It didn't really help like hurt anyone, but also didn't really like help anyone. It was just like fun topics to like learn about and like learn about some like weird things people did. So like I initially had like a six out of 10 rating and then I changed it to 11 out of 10 because I was threatened by a horse with a shotgun, as you would if you were threatened by a horse with a shotgun. But yeah, there, there is like thought behind the rating. It's not like a table that I like intricately detail. It is an on the spot type of rating, but I do put thought into it and have some like reasoning to myself behind it. I hope you guys liked the lobster Fashion. video. I was very nervous writing it, but I think it came out really well. I liked the comedy in it. I liked the skits. I liked the voice acting for the French people. But yeah, 